Welcome, everybody. Um, my name's E.J. E. Monagalland. I'm in the Department of Biology, and I'm also the director of the Oxford Martin Programme in Wildlife Trade, which is hosting uh, Divya for a month as a visiting fellow here at the Oxford Martin School um, as part of the Wildlife Trade Programme. Um, it's been my great honour and pleasure to uh, have known Divya for three years now. Uh, we co-supervise a brilliant PhD, uh, which is being written by Trisha Gupta on um, shark wildlife, shark trade and supply chains. So um, it's been great to get to know Divya online for the last few years and a, a pleasant shock to see her in 3D uh, last week when, <laughs> for the first time. Um, so Divya, started life, like many of us, as a biologist uh, for her undergraduate and her master's. But then she went to do her PhD in human geography at Rutgers University. And that was on fisheries governance by local communities in India. So starting to bring uh, social sciences quite heavily into her work. After that, she was a consultant on tuna fisheries where she learned about commercial supply chains. And then since 2019, she's been assistant professor at Ashoka University in India in the Department of Environmental Studies. So teaching and researching in broadly interdisciplinary social science, uh, particularly around fisheries, local communities, and also importantly, sharks. Divya has got some really fascinating things to say. And so um, thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy her talk. quite an amazing thing to be here, so uh, thanks EJ so much for this opportunity. Um, I think uh, I want to kind of give you an insight into some of the research that I was doing for the last 10 years almost, uh, and this is kind of broadly looking at sustainable fisheries, but also a little bit at some of the research that I've been doing on sharks. So to just give you a little uh, more background about myself. I grew up uh, in a coastal city in India. And so as a person who was interested in conservation, the only sort of wildlife that was accessible to me was marine wildlife. Um, and I saw a lot of it. Because India happens to be one of these places where you get a lot of uh, fish diversity, especially. And both through eating it and through being interested in conservation, I got to know a lot of these. Uh, fish. But India is also known for other things like our enormous population. Um, and this enormous population is putting a lot of pressure on these marine systems. Uh, so we have basically unregulated pollution, uh, huge climate change impacts, uh, other kinds of pressures from just the sheer size of our population. So to be interested in marine biodiversity and then look at the pressures from this population and think about conservation in that context, it seemed like, theoretically at least, the best thing to do would be to set up marine protected areas. Uh, and so I started looking a little bit at the research on marine protected areas uh, and found that unless it's a really fully protected area, it doesn't seem to actually make much sense. So partial protection seems to only provide marginal benefits and only complete protection would really work. And in the Indian context, complete protection um, is pretty much not possible in marine areas because this is what the average fishing harbor looks like in India. So all those things with the rods there, those are the fishing boats. Uh, and this is the fishing harbor. So you can imagine how a fisheries scientist or a government official uh, is trying to walk through this and get information on what species are being caught and who's going where and what the illegal things are, and it's practically impossible. And when fisheries don't look like this, they look like this kind of small-scale fishing, which happens with millions of fishers over 7,000 kilometers of coastline Many of these are small beaches with just villages nearby. Uh, and so in terms of just monitoring all of this, it's complete chaos. It's really difficult to do. Uh, 
the kind of manpower or surveillance that you would need to do this is just crazy. Uh, so given in that context, we have only 0.005% of our exclusive economic zone as marine protected areas. Uh, and it's understandable that even this small proportion is not very well protected because it's really difficult to monitor. And at the same time, the Indian government is really pushing for blue economy and development in the marine sector. Uh, so already India is among the top five um, exporting seafood exporting nations of the world. And we, I mean, the Indian government at least is interested in getting it to be the top a seafood exporting nation. Uh, so with this kind of situation, it does seem like Indian fisheries are primarily open access with a little bit of them receiving partial protection. And this is extremely depressing for uh, anyone who's interested in conservation because it doesn't seem like there's much that we can do. Except maybe if you listen to documentaries like this and also certain statements made by politicians about not eating seafood at all, which would be great, except that there are 5 million people who are fishers. What would we do with them? And there are 14 million people for whom seafood is the only source of protein. How would we provide them with alternates? So there has to be some way to kind of bring this livelihood issue, the food issue, as well as the conservation issue together. And this is something that was really occupying my mind a lot. So it kind of led me to this main question, which is how do we conserve marine species and sustain fisheries and the seafood trade in India? Uh, obviously, this is not a question that can be answered by one person or one research uh, study. So I kind of approached it in bits. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through the various ways in which I thought about this. So first, of course, the question is of policy. So what is the government doing uh, to enable better management or, in fact, to prevent it? Uh, the second is what are the local stakeholders doing? And are they at all interested in conservation? Um, and then to look a little more outward at the slightly more distant stakeholders who are the seafood consumers. Because to me, it seemed like looking only at the fisheries didn't actually result in better management, and one needed to look outward as well. So to kind of answer this first question, you can read a little bit more about this in these two papers uh, listed here. Uh, but I'll be going through them in brief uh, during the talk. So the first thing I did was to look at our national um, regulations, which is the Indian Fisheries Act. And even though it's called the Indian Fisheries Act, it didn't do very much in terms of regulating fisheries. What it mainly seemed aimed at is to reduce conflicts within the fisheries between fishing communities. Uh, but the one good thing it did do was to decentralize uh, some of the re uh, regulations so that the states within India could make some decisions on their own. That was pretty helpful, but um, otherwise it did not seem like it was oriented towards conservation or sustainability in any way. So when we look at what the states did once they got some powers, they created some kind of spatial zonation. So they created this exclusive artisanal zone, which is in blue, uh, which is meant only for small scale fishers and all the other types of fisheries are meant to fish outside. So again, in theory, this looks nice. It's really small, but it's still something. Uh, and so I wanted to look at this in a little more detail. So I decided to go study this in two locations, one on the east coast of India in Tamil Nadu and the other one on the west coast of India in Maharashtra. And I looked uh, specifically at the legislations that each state had put together for the fisheries. And I also interviewed people from the fisheries department to try and understand what their perspective was about their role in the fisheries. And what I found were legislations like this. What I've underlined in red are the schemes and incentives that the government has put in to develop the fisheries and make them more industrial. Uh, 
So on the West Coast, for example, they seem to have put in some schemes, realized that those schemes are creating conflict, put in some conflict resolution regulations, put in more schemes, more regulations, more schemes, more regulations. Whereas on the East Coast, it was put in all the regulations in the beginning and then go crazy with the schemes. So um, this is pretty much how the legislation seems to have thought about it. Uh, when I looked at what the fishers were doing, and I interviewed over 300 fishers, it seemed like there was very low compliance with these spatial regulations. So what you see in brown there are the exclusive artisanal zones. Um, and basically what I found was that everyone was fishing everywhere and nobody was sticking to these zonations. Um, in addition to these kind of spatial regulations, fishers also have licenses, and often these licenses restrict them to fishing within one day's travel time. Uh, if you can see the fishers who moved in blue there, they're going uh, at least 4,000 kilometers away, which is clearly not something you can do in a day. Um, and they were quite open about the fact that some of their fishing trips were 14 days long. Um, and they also admitted to fishing within the exclusive artisanal zones and stuff like that. And all of this is because they knew that nobody is, they're not going to pay any penalty for this and nobody is really enforcing these rules. Um, so it seems like it's really open access and nobody seems to care about what is happening. The fisheries department officials said that their role was only to provide schemes and subsidies to encourage fishing. Um, and when I specifically asked about regulations, they said that there were already so many conflicts among the fishing communities themselves, they didn't want to add conflict by then enforcing regulations. And these conflicts would have become conflicts between the department and the um, fishing community, and so that's something they wanted to avoid. So all of this was work that I did about 10 years ago. And in those 10 years, what has happened is this work, which was led by Claire Collins, where she was looking at the tiny red dot in the middle of the Indian Ocean there, um, if you can see that, uh, which is pretty far away from India, and yet it seems like a lot of Indian fishers are now fishing there illegally. So the illegal behavior that started off in India is now spreading across the Indian Ocean because nobody is doing anything to contain it. So given this situation, the role of the government seems pretty limited. Uh, the government is trying to enable technological change, but this is just creating more conflicts. This is sort of disconnecting the fishing community from the fisheries itself. It's also subsidizing fishing methods like bottom trawling that are known to be ecologically harmful. So this is causing more dysregulation of the environment. And many of these schemes and subsidies that the government put in place are about 40 years old, haven't kept up with inflation. And so now the kinds of boats and motors that they are supposedly helping people buy uh, are way more expensive. So what the fishers have to do is to then make up the rest of the money from money lenders. Um, and this kind of debt is really pushing them to continue fishing unsustainably and illegally. So the fishermen are clearly not complying with legislation because no one's enforcing it. Uh, and if we were to enforce it at this point with this population, the amount of investment in surveillance and monitoring is going to be crazy. Uh, so clearly just letting it go has allowed fishers to move from just India to across the Indian Ocean. So there has to be something better than this. This can't be all doom and gloom. So I started looking at what the fishing communities themselves were doing. And again, you can read more um, at these papers, but I'll get into it a little bit. So I started zooming in, not looking just at the states, but going into some of the villages and seeing what was happening there. Um, and this work was largely social science and qualitative and done during my PhD. Uh, and I found that at the local level, fishers were really concerned about regulations. They wanted regulations and they were putting it in place themselves. So they had identified certain fishing territories that they uh, were taking care of, 
They were making rules about who could fish there and uh, when they shouldn't fish there, what fishing gear could be used or not. And they held meetings like this where everybody had to be involved uh, and make decisions about these fisheries and you know, adjust the rules if needed and so on. And while I started this work just in one small location looking at a few villages, I subsequently moved across uh, the coast and found that many small scale fishers across the entire coast had these kinds of fisheries management institutions in place. It's just that they were not formally recognized, they've not been recorded anywhere, um, and the government either doesn't know or just chooses to let these institutions be without any formal recognition. So all over the place, they seem to have a structure where there was a head village and then a bunch of other villages that followed the rules that they together came up with. They would have general body meetings, often in a temple, uh, pretty much because it followed the same principle as placing your hand as a, on the Bible and declaring that you will tell the truth. Um, and in many cases, these temples were also located at these beautiful locations where you could see an amazing vista of the sea, so like on a cliff top or right on the beach or something like that. Uh, and they made these decisions based on consensus or majority, which meant that they would have to sit together and discuss this a lot to build consensus or to make sure that the majority of people believed a particular thing. They made decisions about what gears they could use, meaning what types of fishing nets, uh, what areas they could use, and surprisingly, many of them had already put in place kind of protected areas. One fisher, in fact, told me that there was something called a reserve bank, which he said was like the Reserve Bank of India that you don't touch unless it's a real emergency. Um, so they also decided about which times of year they could fish and which times, um, which times of day they could fish. And if people didn't follow the rules, they had a complex system of punishments. It wasn't like straight away put you in jail or whatever, but they started with some social ostracism, then maybe a little bit of fines, and finally, if nothing worked, they would resort to violence. And all of this started reminding me of theory that I had read about how people manage commons. Uh, because they had locally adapted rules for usage and maintenance of their resources. There was local participation in decision making and monitoring. Uh, they had graduated sanctions with respect to punishments and cheap conflict resolution mechanisms. Um, and this seemed to fit perfectly with... It's gone. I didn't do anything. Ah, it's back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so this seemed to fit perfectly with Eleanor Ostrom's um, framework and also the work of many other common pool theorists for successfully managed commons. Uh, so while the larger picture looks really doom and gloom, this micro scale uh, work was really good not only for the commercial fisheries, but also for all these other species that are of conservation interest. Um, and these species were benefiting from these regulations as well. So in terms of answering uh, what local fishing communities can contribute, it does seem like they're doing a lot, particularly by creating these relationships of community. Uh, so they're able to regulate access, they're incorporating local ecological knowledge, uh, and they seem to be okay with some economic sacrifice in the short term so that they can gain in the long term. And all of this is allowing them to produce ecologically driven harvests rather than just supplying the market. Um, but it's not all good news because, of course, these things are happening at the micro scale. And given the whole situation of India and its you know, vastness, it's not like these kinds of uh, initiatives are really going to solve the problem. Also, the way the people uh, dealt with outsiders or those who didn't participate was a bit repressive. Um, it requires sort of continuous in-person reinforcement. So every meeting, uh, like the picture I showed you, required fishers to give up a day of fishing in order to be at that meeting and participate. And sometimes those meetings would take the whole day. And it was vulnerable 
to the lack of a supportive environment and markets. And this in particular was something that the fishers kept telling me about, this vulnerability to sub lack of supportive markets. And this made me think that I need to look beyond just this micro scale and start looking at the larger scale again. And when I did that, what I found is that there are parts of the world that have highly regulated fisheries and there are parts that do not. But the parts of the world that have the highly regulated fisheries also have increasing seafood demand that's not being controlled. And their fisheries are not able to meet those demands anymore. So it's all the illegal, unregulated fishing from other parts of the world that is now feeding this demand. And unless we do something about consumption or seafood demand, it's not really going to produce a more equitable and more well-regulated fisheries across the globe. So you can't do fisheries management alone without also looking at consumption. And so that's what led me to then look at consumption. Um, and again, here you can read um, some of these papers on consumption. Uh, the way that I approached it was to look at consumption of threatened species and also consumption of commercially important species. With, res with respect to threatened species, I specifically focused on sharks because in India, we have a culture of eating a lot of shark meat, uh, which is something that wasn't really reported in the conservation space for a really long time. Everyone was focused on China and shark fins. Uh, but it does seem like consumption of shark meat is now becoming a major threat. Uh, and we have a long tradition of it. And we found that it's not only happening in the households, it's also happening in restaurants, particularly in tourist-driven areas like Goa. Um, and this is threatening a lot of our smaller bodied species as well as some of the juveniles of the other species. And this is of great concern. Uh, but in, ad in addition to these uh, threatened species, we also looked at the other species that are being landed. And what we found was, on average, people were catching between 80 to 100 species every day. And these are just edible species, not the dolphins and turtles and uh, other things that people shouldn't be eating. And then we looked at restaurants across the four big metros because they are the biggest drivers of seafood trade in India, uh, particularly when we had the COVID uh, shutdowns in India and these cities shut their borders the fisheries across India's coast collapsed. So um, these you know, metros are the ones that are really driving seafood trade. And so we looked at them and found, on average, people are eating about six species. So on one hand, you have 80 to 100 being caught. And on the other hand, you have six. Um, and there was no significant difference between what people were eating in inland areas versus coastal areas which again doesn't make any sense because coastal areas you should be eating more seafood, I guess. Uh, we also looked across different types of restaurants, economic classes of restaurants, and the seafood being served was, there was no significant difference. It was pretty much the same six species that everyone was eating. Then we looked at what people were eating at home uh, across these same areas, and people were eating the same six species. At the most, they were willing to try about two and a half other species. Uh, and most of the people had no knowledge about where their seafood was coming from or what, was ed what were the other edible species uh, available. So uh, basically, this means that we were failing as consumers. Uh, if we are eating just six out of a possible 80 to 100, so the high priority urban markets are completely out of sync with what's happening uh, in the fisheries. And we need to manage this at multiple scales and multiple steps of the supply chain in order to create these supportive markets for these small scale fishers who are trying uh, to be more sustainable and who are trying to regulate their fisheries. And clearly, fishing management alone cannot meet the challenge of producing more sustainable seafood. So this led me to actually do something about it, because I can't just study a thing and leave it alone. 
Um, and so I started this initiative called In Season Fish, which was sort of based on the ideas that came from the fishing community of like face-to-face -face community building, getting together in that room and meeting each other and talking. Uh, and also on theory that uh, people like Lisa Campbell from Duke University have uh, spoken about as being really important for getting people to work together on an issue. Um, to kind of create something like a community-supported fishery uh, and increase transparency in fisheries management and trade. And the kinds of things that we want to do is to bring together these issues of food, livelihood, and conservation, like I said in the beginning, where we don't talk about these as separate issues, but get everyone together on the same page to talk about it. So some of the ways that we approach it is through straightforward awareness programs with seafood consumers, where we tell them uh, or give them advisories on what seafood they can eat uh, during which times of the year and so on. But in addition to that, we do a whole bunch of other work. Uh, so some of this is um, work like training chefs on the indigenous seafood ingredients that they can use. Um, doing guided tours of fish markets for seafood eaters so that they can find out how to choose more sustainable seafood. We do education programs with school children, uh, research work, of course, um, and also a lot of research into understanding supply chains. Uh, so we started off with a little bit of work in Chennai and now have spread across uh, six coastal states. And all of this work seems to be having an impact. Uh, so last year I received an award that I didn't know existed from a community that I didn't know existed, which was from the restaurant industry. Uh, not that I have anything to do with good cooking and food, but um, they kind of recognized the work that In Season Fish has done in changing the mindsets of chefs in restaurants and at least 100 different restaurants uh, across India voted on this, which meant that our impact was now, um, you know, going across the nation. Um, and some of the other things that we've been doing as a result of research that um, Trisha and others have been involved in is to identify these important areas for sharks and rays especially, as well as for other species, and to kind of aim towards working with local communities to create management systems around these areas. So this is sort of where we are headed to next, um, but our aim is to kind of bring all of this together. And some of the main stakeholders, even in these conservation projects, are chefs, uh, fishing communities, co local conservation organizations, and so on. Um, and we have managed to kind of create these connections where people who thought they were completely disconnected from conservation or from the sea uh, are beginning to see the impact that they are having and how any small difference they can make will actually make a big difference in the long run. So ultimately, coming back to this original question that I had of how to conserve marine species, it seems like working in partnership with a bunch of different stakeholders like fishing communities, seafood industry, and the seafood eating community is really working. Um, one of the main things seems to be building relationships through food. That's something that a lot of people can connect to irrespective of where they're coming from. Uh, and to encourage everyone to think of themselves as conservation stakeholders. So working across these scales has been uh, very time consuming. I mean, I started like 10 years ago, but um, it is rewarding finally now. Um, and of course, none of this would have been possible without a whole bunch of people. Uh, and there are too many people to thank, uh, so I didn't put all their names there, sorry. Um, and also a lot of organizations that have been involved in supporting our work. If you're interested, you can follow us on uh, social media and find out more about what we're doing. And I'll be happy to take any questions now. So, um, Hannah's gonna come around with a microphone and um, ideally if you could use that microphone, then people online can hear you. 
And if you could just introduce yourself, that would be nice too, because uh, then we'd know who you were. Um, I'm buzzing with questions, certainly, but who out there has got a question that they would like to ask? Brian. Uh, Brian Wilson in uh, biology at the university here. Um, Divya, you mentioned obviously the Chagos Archipelago, which is very, very close to my heart. And, and one of the things we certainly noticed was that uh, over COVID, um, we saw this shift from, from small, less well-equipped fishing boats to this incredibly uh, professional well record that came from obviously India. What was the driving force behind that shift of, of Indian fishers coming, I mean, a long, long way to the archipelago? Was it the fact that your own fisheries had, had been hit so hard, or was it the fact that the rewards from this relatively pristine marine protected area were, were so huge? Uh, so I think definitely it's a combination of our nearshore fisheries having uh, been overexploited a lot, uh, but also certain government incentives to shift the, the vessels from nearshore small-scale fishing vessels to like deep water fishing fleets. Uh, so there have been some incentives towards that, and um, I'm not sure how much we have in our deep waters. So if there is a place which is a sitting duck like the Chagos, so <laughs> once you have that vessel, you can obviously go there and uh, do these things. Uh, but it's also interesting uh, in terms of the kinds of networks that these fishers must have in order to be able to go those distances and fish there and for it to still be economically viable for them because these vessels are really expensive to run. We have one over this side. I think um, I'm John from Conservation Optimism. Um, thank you. That was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting to see the commonalities with what's happening with the South Asian fisheries and the European ones, diversity of consumption, for example. And mm -hmm. there's some what works stuff in there and hashtag conservation optimism. Um, but looking through your list of the communities you're working with, the obvious stakeholder that was missing was state and national government mm -hmm. and i wanted to ask whether there'd been any movement with those absolutely important actors yeah. or whether they were still very confused so with the state governments uh, we are starting some work now um, especially in tamil nadu which is the state that i live in so uh, the government there seems to be quite open to having these conversations now, and we've just started having these conversations with them. Uh, as I was saying earlier, because the, the policy is so decentralized, we sort of have to go state by state, and it doesn't really make sense to go straight to the national level and do anything. Uh, so we're hoping that just like how our um, work footprint spread, eventually the policy footprint can spread. You mentioned that the Indian government doesn't enforce its own regulation for obvious reasons. Uh, do they enforce uh, competition from foreign fishing vessels or that's not a problem in India? Uh, so the problem depends on who you ask. Um, the Indian government's official policy is that only the licensed foreign vessels are fishing in Indian waters. Uh, the fishers claim that there are a lot of unlicensed vessels fishing in Indian waters. Uh, there was also an example of an unlicensed Chinese vessel that um, had some emergency on board and had to uh, have like an emergency uh, landing at one of the Indian ports. Strangely, no questions were asked about why that vessel had to land there, but um, I think especially to do with Chinese vessels, I think there's a bit of caution about taking any action. Hey, I'm Max, I'm a student in the Environmental Research DTP. Um, that was really, really interesting. It was great to hear about your work. Um, I did have a question. You described the sort of very intricate institutions that these fishers have and the rules that they generate regarding using then local knowledge and then generating their rules. But you said that there were some people who would not participate in those rules. Were there any sort of indications as to why they wouldn't participate or was it economic or do they just not want to do what they're told in that regard? I'm not sure. Yeah. 
So uh, what I found was that um, some people wanted to shift to a new technology, which the old uh, the rules were not uh, permitting. And so what they ended up doing was, in order to shift to that new technology, because the local community was so against it, they actually brought in a migrant crew. Uh, and so the migrant crew would do all the work, and they were the ones who would get into trouble every time. Uh, but the owners wouldn't actually face that much of a penalty, because at the most, they would sometimes have to pay a fine and then get uh, their nets released or whatever. Whereas the crew sometimes would even get kidnapped and or get beaten up or something like that. So for the crew, it was like a really dangerous thing for them to do. But for the owners, uh, they, the punishments didn't seem uh, enough for them to, you know, the cost didn't outweigh the benefits kind of thing. Uh, so there were a few people who, you know, thought about it that way. But uh, the vast majority of people wanted to remain in the good books of the community for reasons that have nothing to do with fisheries management. Uh, one of the main things that seemed to be driving them was this issue of safety at sea, because they often go out in these really small, rickety boats, uh, which can capsize at any time. Um, and they were saying that they cannot depend on the government to come and rescue them because uh, the government does so little patrolling that it actually doesn't know much of where fishers fish or what, like how to get to them if they are stuck. And so they would rely on the rest of their community. Uh, and this was what was kind of keeping them, you know, in this community relationship. Thank you so much, and congratulations for the work you've been doing within fishing. Um, so my question is, that seems to be an effort that's very located in the Indian market, right? Like you're you're talking about the con the Indian consumer and chefs and restaurants, and what's happening there locally. And I understand that there's, of course, a very big market of seafood internally. Mm -hmm. uh, how's the dynamic with the international markets and some fisheries not necessarily will have internal markets that are big but are driven and that over exploitation is driven by something that's outside mm -hmm. your national jurisdiction um so i know here you would have both things but i'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the international perspective not not necessarily of what happens in the ocean while you are fishing but once the the landing secure what happens yeah, so this is where I think um, some of these traceability initiatives like the Marine Stewardship Council and uh, other such certifications might uh, make a difference. Um, but I think this uh, whole idea of community supported fisheries, for instance, came up during my PhD work in the US because I saw it happening there. Uh, where people had started to realize that a lot of their uh, ingredients, whether uh, seafood or otherwise, were coming from all these exotic locations and they had sort of no control over how these products were created and how they were being shipped there and stuff like that and decided to start eating local ingredients. Um, and I saw it firsthand in terms of community supported agriculture where uh, people were had like their little farm plots which gave them vegetables every week uh, and things like that and realized that you could also do this for fisheries and by the time i finished my phd people had started doing that um, in parts of the northeast um, and so uh, i guess that that kind of consumer realization uh, needs to happen but also the the big players involved in these kinds of transfers. And in our work, we have tried to engage with some of these seafood traders, but it has been really slow going. Um, of course, their, their first question is, what's in it for us? Um, and we haven't been able to give them a good enough answer for that yet. Um, but uh, I'm starting to see that between before the pandemic and now, things are starting to change. So we have a couple of people now who, are, who seem to be interested at least in a conversation. And we're hoping that that will go forward. So I'm going to take, uh, jump in with my shared privilege <laughs> and say that leads nicely into, I'd really like to hear a little bit more about your theory of change, about why moving from six to 80 or 100 species is a good thing. 
because I guess that assumes that those 80 to 100 species aren't currently supporting the livelihoods and the protein needs of people on the ground and that would be taken away and also that there's some kind of level of under exploitation of some of those species that would allow that demand to, to flow. So I wonder if you could just explain a little bit more why it's a good thing for people to eat more variety. Okay. Uh, so what's happening now with the diversity of fish is that um, the lower value species or the lower quality species uh, are not being eaten by people. They are uh, going into fish meal production, which eventually goes to feed animals. So it's either the aquaculture fish or pets that are largely eating those uh, fish. And if it's going into that kind of mass production, uh, the amount of money that fishers get is really low. So if they go out and they get 100 species, then you imagine that they are expecting 100 pounds or 100 rupees, whatever, for that. Um, they are getting only 10 from human consumption or six, whatever. Um, and the rest of it is just like 0.25 because it's all going into this low value supply chain. Um, but if they could get their full hundred from that, they wouldn't have to go out so many times to keep fishing. And we saw, again, we saw that happen during uh, the COVID pandemic when uh, after the first shutdown, which was, um, complete chaos and nobody knew what was happening. I think by the time we got to the second shutdown, the governments got their action uh, together and actually paid people uh, to compensate them for their economic loss. So they gave them some kind of a monthly uh, subsistence payment. And the fishers were very happy with that. They actually reduced the number of fishing days. Some of them didn't go fishing at all. Uh, and this was because they had that money. And when I asked them why they were doing that, they said it's terribly uncomfortable to go fishing all the time and we'd rather not do it. And if we had a choice, we wouldn't do it. Um, and so I guess that's where it's coming from. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, just like interested to know what's what's been the biggest challenge in setting up the initiative and, and scaling up to, up to the, like, the good work that you've been doing? Yeah, I think uh, finding people who are also uh, thinking in a similar way and able to uh, work as part of this group, I think finding all these people who I had listed, including Sisha, um, <laughs> who are interested in these ideas and uh, sort of not stuck on like only a marine protected area approach or only food or whatever to kind of have that interdisciplinary breadth. I think that's been uh, one of the biggest things that has kept us from scaling up. So another question then. <laughs> um, have you approached the aquaculture industry? If they're where the, the trash fish is going, how yeah. do they feel about um, potentially moving to alternatives? So uh, right now they are experimenting with alternatives, but it doesn't seem to be commercially viable yet in India. Um, but also in India, while the prawn fishery seems to be really dependent on these, uh, on the fish meal, we do uh, have aquaculture of some more um, herbivorous and inland fish. And I think if that could be encouraged rather than the prawn fishery, I think that would make a lot of difference. Um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, are there any concerns from the community about the quantity of fish that are there for them to catch? Or is there any connection or correlation to how far they go every time to catch the fish? Because, well, it is increasingly declining the fish. So is there any concern? Yeah, so the, the communities that I was talking about who've created these fishing management institutions, they are really concerned. Um, and they are the ones who obviously are already doing things about it. Uh, but then there are also these other people who are going all the way to the Chagos and other places um, who don't seem to be uh, as concerned because for them, there's no limit to where they can go. So if we ask them questions about are fish declining, their response is no, they're just going deeper. Uh, so it depends on who you're talking to. Mm 
wondering, you said that um, only about six species are being consumed. Is that being fed back into the fishing communities? And do they have options for things like more selective gears if they are concerned about um, everything that they're taking out? Are they being given alternative options to allow them not to take quite so much effectively? Yeah, so the selective gear thing is something that these uh, fishing management institution people are trying, not so much in terms of using different gear, but using the gear differently. Uh, so they check their gear more often and they adjust it in different currents so that they at least primarily catch what they want to catch um, and avoid uh, other species and so on. But at the same time, we are a tropical fishery, which has a huge diversity. So there is a limit to how much specificity you can have. Um, and so that way, even these small scale fishers do end up catching a lot of diversity. Okay, well, I think the conversation could go on and on. And did you have your hand up? I do. Oh, go, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, was there any pushback on the kind of, not really pressure, but the education to change their consumption practices with the choices and like in-season eating? Yeah, so uh, when I've done these talks with seafood eaters, uh, they've always told me, why are you talking to us? You should go talk to the fishermen. Uh, and then when you talk to the fishermen, they say, why are you talking to us? You should go talk. So it's always people pushing back. But um, at the same time, when you present people with what is actually being caught, like when we do these uh, guided tours of fish markets or uh, the fish landing sites, I think that's something that's so in your face that they can't push back because they are seeing the diversity there. They are seeing the difference in quality where the small scale fishers catch is so much fresher than what a person from a 14 day old trip is bringing in. Um, and so there's just some irrefutable facts that they can't, uh, you know, deny. Brilliant. Well, Divya is here for another few weeks. Um, it would be really great uh, if you could engage with her while she's here, because I think she's very keen to make collaborative connections and yes. just to chat with people, have coffee with people while she's got time here. So yeah. um, I hope the conversation will continue. So thank you, Divya, for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you.